So before we stop, can I check, have you guys had lectures on solid state in a mile yet? I did do with Marina last year. Last year with Marina. Last year with Marina, okay. Yeah. Lots of maths. Yeah, okay, so this is going to be the antithesis of that. Um, <laughs> so the, the goal really is to, again, go over solid state in a mile. But this time, what I'm going to try and do is instead of um, swamp you with mathematics, is to try and give you um, solid foundation on which you can interpret biological solid state in our data and try and flag up the types of um, methods that we can use and how we use them to study biological systems. So there's quite a lot of examples. Uh, and what we're trying to do is sort of relate all these, um, relate what we're starting to see in the spectra with all these sort of quantum mechanics that we've gone through before. So, you know, all these uh, spectral features, you know, the anisotropic interactions that are starting to appear within the spectrum. So, um, first of all, I just, whilst I was preparing this this morning, um, came across this slide, um, which basically tells you why we want to use things like solid state NMR. So, from a biological perspective, it's great. So people usually think about NMR in terms of dealing with these small molecules in solution here. But actually when we're talking about NMR, what we want to be, well, sorry, when we're talking about biology, what we really want to be able to do is go from this sort of molecular level here, right the way back up to the cell and the organism level. And so if we have techniques which can enable us to sit there and address this, um, this hierarchy of complexity in biological systems, then these are really the tools for us. And so the nice thing is, in terms of solid state NMR, yeah, we can study these small molecules in solution and we do solution-style experiments. As we start to go up, we have things like biological membranes. These start to behave typically like people view solid samples, so we can start to study these. We can start to sit there and think about taking organelles out of cells, and we can start to study the composition of these things um, in situ. And we can get to a point where we can put whole cells inside the spectrometer and start to get information out of them. And so the key thing is, is okay, we can, we can measure spectra for these type of um, samples, but can we actually get information out of these spectra? So what I'm going to do over the next few minutes is sort of give you an overview about how I use solid state NMR, and then try and flag up how we've got to use these examples. Um, sorry, how we can use solid state NMR to look at these types of systems. So if you go back to those lectures you did on solid state NMR, uh, the first thing you know about solid state NMR is if you put a solid in a magnetic field, and you try and do you need to do magnetic reference on it, you get this broad, featureless uh, line. And so the nice thing is it actually contains lots and lots of information, and we'll go back to that later on. The downside is, though, if we have a molecular system with thousands, millions of atoms in it, what we don't have is any form of resolution. So the first thing we want to do is be able to take this spectrum here with all the information in it and try and get some form of resolution so that we can start to assign spectral features to particular sites within the molecule. So the first thing we're going to have to look at is basically how we can get <coughs> these um, well-resolved spectra. And when we've got these well-resolved spectra, what we'd like to do then is be able to correlate these different uh, sites within the uh, system that we're studying so that we can start to understand things about you know, the torsion angles between atoms, so that we can start to understand the dynamics of particular sites within the molecule, uh, so we can understand distances between different sites so that we can start to characterize this biological system to the molecular level. So what we're going to do over the next, uh, series, uh, uh, through the next series of lectures is basically look at the tools which enable us to go from this static spectrum that we see here to something which is relatively well resolved, and then finally how we can use this to try and get some form of structural and dynamic information out of that system. Okay, so um, this is what we're going to do. Solid state NMR. We're going to go through what anisotropic interactions are. And we have quite a range of people in the audience, so forgive me if it's oversimplistic, but at the same time, uh, at least then we're all starting from common play. Uh, we're going to look at how we can manipulate them. So we're going to look at how we can prepare things like oriented samples and how we can prepare uh, samples for magic angle spin. Then we're going to look at how we can exploit these uh, anisotropic interactions in terms of things like cross-polarization and dipole recoupling into the variance. And finally, we'll look at how we can use it to probe structure and dynamics um, of the system. So, if we look at the outline for the first lecture, this is pretty much what I'd like to go through. So, first of all, what is anisotropy? 
um, how does it affect the NMR spectrum? What interactions have you raised to these anisotropic uh, properties? Uh, give a brief overview about how we describe these anisotropic interactions. Then I'll give you some uh, examples. So, for example, chemical shielding anisotropy. We'll look at its orientational dependence and the resonance frequency. Um, how we come up with the power spectrum, we saw on the previous slide. And then we'll move on to these dipolar and quadrupolar interactions, which we use quite extensively in um, biological solid state in the So, what is anisotropy? Well, the simplest uh, way of doing anisotropy is a property which has an orientational dependence. So, uh, if you take a piece of wood and you put a weight on the top of the piece of wood and you're push, pushing it down lengthways, what you find is it has a lot of strength. If you sit there and you put a piece of wood horizontal and you put the weight on top of it, what you find is it breaks. So this is an anisotropic property in the case of wood. Okay? So that's in the real world. So what the question is, is how does this impinge on what we see um, at the, the molecular level, at the quantum mechanical level? So the quantum mechanical level essentially brings about the same kind of um, properties. So what we see here is I've just taken a small molecule of glycine. And what I've done is calculate where the position of the different uh, resonance lines will be depending on the orientation of the molecule with respect to the magnetic field. And what you see is that if we have one orientation, we have a peak over here on the left of the spectrum, we can rotate it a little bit, it'll move, we can rotate it again to get a different position. So in that respect, whatever interaction is giving rise to this spectrum here is anisotropic in nature. Depending on the orientation of the, magnet, uh, the molecule in the magnetic field, we get a different chemical shift. Okay? So in contrast to liquid state NMR, where the molecules are all tumbling very rapidly, and we don't see any difference in the resonance positions, here what we see is if we put a uh, molecule in the magnetic field, a static um, condition, as we change its orientation, we'll get different um, resonances. Now clearly, if we take this as worst case example, and we take our molecule of glycine, and we grind it up in a mortar and pestle and put it in our NMR machine, what we'll start to see, if we look for example at the nitrogen side, is this power spectrum we see here. So here what we have is basically the superimposition of all these different molecular orientations weighted over the surface of the sphere. Okay? <coughs> and the reason we don't see these anisotropic interactions in the liquid state, as I mentioned before, is because the molecules are tumbling rapidly on the NMR timescale, so what we find is that they're average to <coughs> their isotropic value. And I'll come back to that later on. So, we know that we have these anisotropic interactions in the spectrum, because if we take a, a static spectrum of lysine, we know that we don't just get you know, two carbon lines and one nitrogen line. We have broad distributions. So what type of interactions are occurring at the quantum mechanical level which are giving rise to these broad distributions? So, at this point what we can do is we can start to build up uh, our NMR Hamiltonian again. So this is the Hamiltonian, for those people who are not overly familiar with it, is basically, it's the equation which tells us where lines are going to resonate in our NMR spectrum. It's its simplest level. Okay, so if you do liquid state NMR, you're probably pretty familiar with the isotropic chemical shift. So, this is the point which remains invariant under any form of rotation of the sample. What we see are basically two sharp lines. We also have this other isotropic interaction here, which is called the J coupling. So if you take two carbon atoms which are next to one another, what you find is they're coupled um, um, by this J coupling. It gives rise to about 50, 40 to 50 hertz splitting in the spectrum. But again, it's isotropic. So irrespective of the orientation of the sample in the magnetic field, we'll always get the same spectrum. What we also have is these anisotropic interactions. So the first one is the so-called chemical shielding anisotropy. So this is the basically the one that describes the um, distribution of electrons surrounding the nucleus and how the nucleus gets shielded by these electrons. And the next one is basically the so-called dipolar interaction. And this dipolar interaction is basically the interaction between uh, two nuclei uh, in close proximity to one another. And so what we can do is we can add up all these different terms. We also have this quadrupolar interaction here, which we'll come back to. And if we add all these terms up, what we start to see is we'll get these um, power type spectra we get here if we average um, all the resonance frequencies up over um, a power distribution. Okay. Um, so the first thing we need is some tools that we can use to describe uh, these types of interactions. And so the tools that we use to describe these interactions are so-called uh, tensors. Okay? So tensors, they come in several different flavors. 
uh, we can have zero refract tensors. Um, so this is basically a physical property which is independent of its coordinate system. So it's stable. Okay, so the simplest example is if you measure a distance between two points, that is a scalar value. You've given it no direction, but you think it's just a distance between two points. You said nothing about where it is in space. So an example of a scalar property in terms of NMR would be for something like the J coupling or the isotropic chemical shift. Because irrespective of where it is and what orientation it has, it will always give us the same value. Then we have so-called first rank tensors. So this is basically a coordinate which depends on the frame of reference. So it has a vector. It behaves like a vector. So if we think about a magnetic field in solid state NMR, this is a classic example of a first rank tensor. It basically it has a single direction, and we can represent it as a vector. And then we also have these so-called second rank tensors. Um, and these second rank tensors are basically the things which enable us to describe our chemical shielding and isotropy and our dipole coupling. And so if we look Jump ahead a little bit here. Uh, so this is just to go reiterate the point I wanted to make earlier. So if you have a rank zero tensor, it behaves like a sphere. So if we measure the diameter of a football or the radius of a football, we can measure it by a rank zero tensor. Okay? If we want to look at a magnetic field, we can measure it as a vector, we can measure it as a rank one tensor. If we want to describe the distribution of our electrons surrounding a the nucleus, then we need basically three components to describe this. This is why we get to this second rank tensor, and we can describe these by these three by three matrices. Okay? So that's what you see here. So in the general case, what you can do is you can look at the three principal components of this, um, in this case, this sort of rugby ball shaped molecule, uh, electron distribution. And what you can do is you can put, you can basically write out vectors for i, j, and k. And in the unique case where basically i, j, and k are aligned along what we call the principal axis system, what you will end up with is this diagonal matrix here where you have basically xx, y, y, and zz, and that will give you the size of these different interactions in the different directions. Okay, is that clear? Yeah. Okay, so that's great. Um, we have these second rank tensors. Uh, what's not so convenient is if we want ways of writing them down. So at the moment we can, the simplest level, we need at least three elements to describe it. Um, it would be convenient if we could write these down such that we can basically describe this shape in terms of single parameters. So frequently in the NMR literature, what you'll find is that these second rank tensors are parameterized. Um, and so they can parameter be parameterized in many different ways. What people do will give you the principal, compo uh, the principal components of the second rank tensor. So in that case, these diagonal elements from this matrix here. But what you will also find is that they're parameterized in terms of um, an isotropic component, so the average of these three components in the principal axis system. You can see that they're parameterized in terms of an anisotropy, which is basically this component here, AZZ, minus the average, the isotropic uh, value of the tensor. And then finally, we can come up with what we call an asymmetry parameter, which is basically the difference between the two other components, YY y and XX, divided by the anisotropy. And if you use this nomenclature, you basically make this assumption that basically AZZ minus the isotropic uh, component of your tensor is greater than XX, which is greater than YY. Okay? And if you do that, you should end up with um, an eta, which is always between 0 and 1. And uh, the anisotropy can be both positive and negative. So in terms of basically characterizing these things, what it means is we can basically just talk about an isotropy, we can just talk about an isotropic um, value, or we could talk about an asymmetry parameter. So when you're reading through papers and you see these delta, eta, term, gut, that's basically what we're seeing here. Okay. So, if we take a look at the, the chemical shielding anisotropy to start off with, because this is the one that people typically see in the um, static carbon spectrum. Chemical shielding anisotropy is basically the perturbation of the magnetic field due to the electrons which surround the nucleus. And so if you think about the electron distribution of electrons around the nucleus, which people here are chemists, the electron distribution around the nucleus is never symmetric, or very rarely is it symmetric. And so what this means is that if we're going to sit there and describe this distribution, we're going to need um, one of these second rank tensors, and that's what we call the chemical shielding anisotropy. So a nice example is if you think about, it, for example, a carbonyl group. What we see here is we have an oxygen atom, highly uh, electronegative, 
uh, pulling the electrons away from the carbon atom. And so what this means is that your electrons surrounding your carbon and your carbon atom group are highly distorted. And so if you that's in those type of cases, what you would expect is that you'd have a very, very large anisotropy, and probably in this case a very large asymmetry parameter as well. Okay. So if you think about the chemistry, you could start to understand a little bit about what these um, what the chemical shielding of anisotropy A should look like, uh, and B, how it's going to be aligned with respect to the molecular system. Okay. So, if we think of our chemical shielding and isotropy, as I said, we can um, uh, view it as a second rank tensor. So we have these uh, nine components here, which describe our second rank tensor with respect to the magnetic field. We can write out Hamiltonian for the system, so we take the different components um, of our spin state, multiply it by our chemical shielding and isotropy, and project, project it onto our magnetic field. And we can write this down to simplify the form of the Hamiltonian you see here. Okay. Does that make a little bit of sense so far? So what we're doing at the moment is basically looking at the distribution of electrons with respect to the magnetic field. Okay. So what we see uh, is if we start to ignore the components which are processing rapidly around the magnetic field, uh, we're left basically with the components of the tensor which is aligned along the magnetic field, so the z axis. Uh, magnetic field, we can basically calculate the resonance frequency of the line sigma z versus omega zero. And so at this point, um, what we know, what we can see is that the position of the, the resonance frequency is proportional to the sigma cz component in the laboratory frame. Now, the downside is, if we go back a second, in the laboratory frame, this makes the assumption that this matrix here is diagonal. Okay? Now, typically, that's not the case because normally our molecules are not aligned with the magnetic field. So, what do we have to do? What we're going to have to do is somehow rotate our uh, second rank tensor from its principal axis system, so its diagonal form, into the laboratory frame. And so, this is what you see here. So, here we have our uh, tensor in its um, principal axis system. So we have um, ZZ, XX, and YY aligned with the uh, coordinate system. So we'll end up with a diagonal matrix. But in the laboratory frame, what we need to do is basically rotate it um, so that these are now aligned with, we can work out what component is aligned with the Z axis, so our magnetic field. And to do that, we use um, basically a rotation matrix. And we can view these rotations from the principal axis system to our laboratory frame using these three Euler angles, alpha, beta, and gamma. So if you see here, basically, you can see how you have to basically rotate your coordinate system to get from its principal axis system to the laboratory frame. Um, so yeah, so basically what we're going to do is we're going to multiply our chemical shielding and isotropy by our rotation matrix R. So what's our rotation matrix R? Our rotation matrix R is this rather hideous looking thing here. Um, and you can basically, if we want to do this transformation, we want to go from our principal axis system to our laboratory frame, we take our rotation matrix R, multiply it by our um, chemical shielding and isotropy in the principal axis system, and we multiply it by the inverse. Yep. The, the inverse rotation matrix, should that be is that allowed to be the inverse and not the adjoint because the principal axis system is diagonal? Should it not be the adjoint matrix? Um, I'd have to go back and check to be sure. Yeah. I'll, I'll dig it out next time. Yeah, sure. So uh, if we do this thing, then we're going to get our um, principal axis system, uh, we're going to get our chemical shielding and isotropy into the laboratory frame. And you can trust me, if we start to multiply out all this horrible all these horrible equations here, what we can end up with is a general form for the chemical shielding uh, anisotropy, uh, where basically we have this isotropic term here. So this is basically the, um, uh, the trace of the chemical shielding anisotropy divided by three, multiplied by this, uh, by the, the anisotropy over two, times these three cos squared d to minus, uh, v to minus one, with this um, uh, term here, the asymmetry parameter multiplied by these alpha and beta terms here. 
when we do that, what we can do is basically come up with the position we would expect our chemical shielding isotropy, which would be, the, sorry, the position of our resonance line to have for a given orientation of a molecule with respect to the magnetic field. Okay? So this basically just puts some bones on trying to understand where our resonance line is going for um, with respect to a given molecular orientation with respect to the magnetic field. So we'll come back to this time and time again because we're now going to go through each of the different components. But the key point is we can now write out this expression and we see it's dependent on these angles beta and alpha. So what does that mean? What it means in real terms is if we take our uh, if we take, for example, a single crystal um, and we take, for example, an axiosymmetric symmetric tensor, such as we've seen here, what we find is that as we rotate a single crystal within the magnetic field, uh, as we alter the angle, what we see is that our resonance line moves. Okay? So that's sort of what we were saying right at the start. But you can actually do it. You can put in like a, nice, uh, a single crystal or something like Lucy. You can measure the nitrogen 15 spectra where you have this. Um, Actually, symmetric tensor, so one where basically the xx and the yy coordinates are the same. What you can do is you can follow this position around, and from this you can work out the orientation of your molecule with respect to the magnetic field. That makes sense so far? Yeah? So, why do we care about doing that? Well, we can actually start to use that, and we'll go back to some examples later on as to how we can use this type of information to obtain, uh, to start to probe structural biological molecules. So this does raise the issue then of what happens if we have our power patterns. Well, if we have our power patterns, what we have is basically the average over all the different orientations in our sample. So we can basically, we can look at our signal as a function of these Euler angles here. We can integrate over the Euler angles alpha and beta, and we have to weight them according to the probability of finding them aligned with the magnetic field or uh, perpendicular to the magnetic field. And so if you evaluate this, if you take at the state where we have like this um, actually symmetric pattern here, so where e to equals zero, what you see is you have um, what we call an actually symmetric power pattern. So the type of thing you would see, for example, for a phospholipid and a lipid bile. If we sit there and we have something where eta is non zero, what we see is that we start to see these different components here, sigma one, one, sigma two, two, sigma three, three. Um, and if you take it to its uh, to the extreme, what you find is that you can, for example, if you have an asymmetry parameter of one you find basically these three principal components are distributed pretty much evenly across the width of the um, power pattern. Okay? So really being able to do this transformation from the principal axis system into the laboratory frame, we need to really this position to it now to calculate where we expect these resonance points to appear in our solid state down spectra. Now, I flagged this up a moment ago, but we, there are actually some empirical um, relationships between the principal axis system and the molecular frame. So what do I mean by this? What I mean is basically there, there, are, there are empirical rules which enable us to sit there and predict how our principal axis system is going to be related to the chemistry. So if we know that, for example, we have a carbon R group, we can take a pretty good guess at where, which direction these principal axis systems are going to be aligned with respect to that carbon R group. So if you look, for example, at methyl groups, what you tend to find is methyl groups rotate rapidly. So they tend to be actually uh, symmetric. Um, and the uh, principal axis is along the threefold symmetry axis of the methyl group. Okay? If we take ring carbons, they have three distinct tensor elements. Uh, the most shielded is perpendicular to the plane, the least shielded is bisecting the carbon 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 bond, the ring. Um, So yeah, okay, most shielded direction is either perpendicular to aromatic carbons along the C3 axis for methyl groups or perpendicular to the sp 2 plate in carbon ion or carboxylic acids. Okay. Um, the least shielded direction in the ring plane bisecting the CCC angle, uh, perpendicular to the C3 axis for the methyl groups uh, in the sp 2 plane for carbon ion carboxylic acid groups. And the intermediate shielding is usually tangential to the ring for aromatic systems and in the sp2 plane and perpendicular to the cc bond to things like carboxylic acids. So even if you look through the literature and you can't work out exactly where you, um, where you expect your principal axis system to be, if you start to look at the chemistry, there are some empirical rules 
Um, and this does serve as a good validation if you're going to sit there and go and do your Gaussian simulations or your cast step simulations to look at where you expect the chemical shielding ion to be. You can at least see if it, the result of your calculation makes a little bit of sense with what's known in terms of the uh, orientation of these tensors more generally. So it's a useful check. Okay. Um, so, it's chemical shielding anisotropy. The next anisotropic interaction we use quite widely in um, solid state NMR is a so called dipolar interaction. So, if you want to calculate the interaction between the two dipoles, you can view this classically, in which case you get the following interaction energy here, or you can view it in a quantum mechanical form, where we have here. Now, again, uh, the dipolar coupling, we can describe it as a second round tensor. Um, in this case, though, it's always actually symmetric. And in this case, it's always aligned along the bond vector. Okay? So if you take two nuclei, it's always going to be um, the sort of internuclear vector between these two, two uh, spinners. So, it's, like I say, it's a, sec a symmetric second rank tensor, so eta is always zero for a dipolar coupling. And again, uh, if we're going to sit there and work out how it's going to affect our spectrum, what we need to do is do this rotation from our principal axis system into our laboratory frame. And we can do that, and we get the following two power spectra. So if we look at, for example, the homonuclear case, and um, we add up over all the different molecular orientations, um, what we'll find is that we get this so-called peg pattern that we see here. And we'll see that the separation here is basically three quarters of the uh, anisotropy. Okay? If we go to the heteronuclear case, what we find is a separation between these two, uh, this splitting here, um, is basically equal to half the anisotropy between the two spins. Okay? So in this case, for example, if we take two protons, two carbon atoms, we'd expect three quarters of the anisotropy. Uh, if we take, for example, a carbon and a nitrogen, we expect the splitting in our phase spectrum uh, to be basically half of the um, anisotropy. Next one, uh, we have the so-called quadrupolar interaction. So this is basically restricted to only those nuclei where we have spins greater than, um, uh, only nuclei with a spin greater than one half. Uh, so basically where the uh, nucleus contains an electronic quadrupole moment. Um, again, uh, we can basically view this as basically the interaction of the nuclear spin with this electronic quadrupole moment. So we can write that Hamiltonian like this. And in this case, basically, again, what we have is this second rank tensor with its three principal components. And now what we can do is we can write out the anisotropy for the quadrupolar interaction, and we can write out the asymmetry for it as well. And uh, in this case, there's no restriction on what the asymmetry is, so you'll find them very quite widely. But again, we can do this transformation from the uh, principal axis system to the laboratory frame. And if we do that, what we end up with is now we end up with our two resonances. And as we alter the angle of our crystal now with respect to the magnetic field, we get these nice sort of uh, plots coming out, which basically show us how our quadrupolar interaction is aligned with respect to the magnetic field. So at that point, if we know how our quadrupolar interaction is aligned with our molecular system, we know how uh, our molecule is oriented with respect to the magnetic field. Okay? <coughs> and so that's not uh, irrelevant. If, for example, you want to start to look at uh, orientation of functional groups, you can sit there and think about introducing deuterons into the system so that you can start to look at basically how different functional groups are going to be aligned with respect to the magnetic field. And we'll come back to that in a moment. So, this is which maths I'm going to deal with. Um, so, the question is, is can we explore these anisotropic interactions? We know that these make our spectrums very broad and they reduce the resolution that we have in them. Uh, but can we actually make use of them? And so actually, what you find is if you look at biological NMR, which perhaps made you know, more use than most people have. Um, so for example, we're in a position frequently to be able to prepare oriented samples. So not necessarily by making, for example, single crystals of proteins, but for example, if you take a, a biological membrane, it's, possibly to, it's possible to macroscopically align this mag um, biological membrane with respect to the magnetic field. And if we can do this, then we can do a very simple one-dimensional NMR spectrum. We can look where our resonance lines appear in the spectrum, and this will give us our information about how particular functional groups are aligned with respect to the magnetic field. 
We can also use them to study the dynamics that we have in the system. So we can, for example, look at the averaging of these anisotropic interactions. If we have motion in the system, which is on a similar time scale to the size of these anisotropic interactions, what we'll find is that it will get motionally averaged. And in contrast to the liquid state NMR, where this motional averaging basically, uh, the overall motional averaging of the system always gives you these narrow lines, in this case, what we can do is these dy this dynamics is pro projected onto particular rotation axes. And this can give us information about how a molecule is moving within the system. We can also use it to look at things like the local, uh, the local environment within the molecule. So, for example, if you look at, for example, the chemical shielding and isotropy, if we have information about the principal components of these tenses, then what we can do is understand a little bit, for example, about how the hydrogen bonding occurs in the backbone of proteins. Similarly, if we look at things like the quadrupolar interaction, if we start to um, uh, if we start to measure out the different components of the, the quadrupolar interaction, we can start to understand something about the local electronic environment where that quadrupolar site is. So, um, what I'm going to do is start off with um, dynamics of um, averaging of anisotropy. So, this is an example from many years ago. Uh, take a very simple um, protein. So, this is a single alpha helix. So basically, what you can view this basically is a, um, a peptide backbone wrapped around a rod. Now, in this case, this helix is actually relatively hydrophobic. And so what we can do is we can actually embed it into um, a lipid binder. And why do we care about this? Well, we care about this if you think about, for example, the structure of receptor proteins on the surface of cells. Frequently, they're these single transmembrane domains. Okay. If we're looking at things that, for example, anchor the cytoskeleton to particular parts within particular cells, again, they have these single spanning transmembrane domains. Now, what's interesting, though, is basically if these things start to interact, then you'll change the dynamics in the system. Okay? So, here what we've done is basically made use of the quadrupolar interaction to measure the rotational correlation time of this particular protein within the bilayer. And so here what we've done is we've taken this alanine side chain here. So alanine side chain is basically and in this case what we've done is we've deuterated it. And so we have our alanine side chain which is giving rise to our deuterium spectrum. Now, if we sit there and freeze out all the motions in the system, what we end up with is this sort of peg spectrum, which is pretty much what I showed you a moment ago, um, for a static power spectrum of um, a deuterated sample. So we have this quadrupolar interaction here, which is giving us a splitting here. Um, and we can use this as a measure of the dynamics. So the moment you see here, this is classically what we would see um, for a alanine group. So we have here basically a splitting, I think it's about 27 kilohertz in width. And this basically comes from the motional averaging that you have through the rotation of the methyl group. So typically you would expect these deuterons to have um, quadrupolar interaction of about 160 kilohertz. But because these, uh, this methyl group is rotating rapidly at the temperatures we're measuring, what we find is average to this uh, reduced value we have here. So, if we freeze the motion of these particular proteins in the bilayer, we have this relatively broad spectrum. But what we see here is that this alanine group is basically oriented at about 54 degrees with respect to the helix long axis. And now what happens is if we sit there and we change the system such that the peptide, the protein can actually rotate within the bilayer, all of a sudden what happens is this quadrupolar interaction gets projected onto the rotation axis. So basically the quadrupolar interaction will basically be averaged by the following term. So this is a break, so basically we have this 3 cos squared d to minus 1 dependence as we project this anisotropic interaction onto the axis of rotational averaging. And if we do this and the group's aligned at about 54 degrees, as you would predict, this term here starts to head towards zero. So what we find is we have almost complete averaging of our um, anisotropic interaction, in this case the quadrupolar interaction. And we can actually use this then to sit there and see how the protein behaves. For example, if it binds to another protein partner, then what we'll see is that the motion gets restricted. If the motion gets restricted, we go from this state to this state. 
But very simply, by deuterating one site in the small peptide, what we can do is start to probe this dynamics within the lipid binder. Okay? We'll perhaps come back to this again in a moment. So, um, the next way we can start to use these anisotropic interactions is basically to look at oriented samples. And so if we want to make look at oriented samples, what we need to be able to do is basically either crystallize them. So we want to make very large crystals of our sample, uh, such that we can orient them with respect to the magnetic field. We want to be able to make oriented membranes. So basically make a light, um, take biological membranes and orient them with respect to the magnetic field. Or we can sit there and think about using things like fibers. So people have used these type of techniques quite a lot to study things like silk and DNA. So in terms of crystallization, this is pretty much not been used uh, to study biological systems. A lot of the other early work where people were trying to understand how the uh, anisotropic interactions were related to the molecular frame, uh, did a lot of these studies on relatively small molecules, so small amino acids and these type of things. But you tend not to find it applied to large proteins. Because invariably, if we can get a very large crystal of a protein um, that we can sit there and start to get NMR signals off, um, if you want to understand the structure of this protein, you'd much rather go over to a synchrotron and get this X-ray structure. Um, contrast, though, if we look at things like oriented membranes, if you take, for example, membrane proteins, these proteins don't crystallize very nicely. But because we can introduce this um, macroscopic alignment into the sample, what you find is we can start to uh, look at the orientation of different functional groups with respect to the magnetic field. Um, Similarly, if you take a fiber, so for example, if you take spider silk or if you take um, silk from um, silkworm, what you find is that along the length of this fiber, you'll find that many of these anisotropic interactions are aligned with a fiber axis. So if you then basically, for example, wind your silk onto a bobbin such that the strands are oriented in a particular direction, again, you can start to look at how different uh, anisotropic interactions, therefore functional groups, are related to the microscopic alignment that you have in your sample. So this is just an example that where so some work that I've done on um, the so-called acetylcholine receptor. So this is a this is a huge protein. So we're talking here about a 280 kilodalton protein, and this 280 kilodalton protein is actually embedded in a lipid binder. So it has a, an effective molecular weight of, of, of megadalton. So your chances of studying it by liquid state NMR are pretty slim. And until quite recently, we had no crystal structure for it either. But having said that, it's a very very important pharmacological target. Everybody who smokes cigarettes sits there and sits there in a taxis receptor. And so what's actually quite interesting is to start to understand a little bit about the pharmacology of this molecule at the molecular level. But if we can't do crystallography and we can't do liquid state NMR, on the whole, it's very difficult to get this high resolution structural information. So um, what we set out to do initially was basically start to look at how uh, the native ligand of this uh, receptor, in this case acetylcholine, is oriented in its binding site. So what we've done is basically we've synthesized this acetylcholine molecule here with deuterons in it. So now what we have is basically deuterons in these three methyl groups here, in this quaternary, medium, uh, quaternary ammonium group. And so um, the idea was that if we have um, these, this quaternary ammonium group labeled, what we should be able to do is prepare macroscopically aligned membranes. So basically all our receptors are aligned with one direction. Uh, in one direction with respect to the magnetic field. And then what we should be able to do, um, so the best case scenario, is basically do a tilt angle series, such as the one that we see here. We can measure the splitting between these two peaks here, and therefore we should be able to work out the, ang the angle, this axis here, with respect to the magnetic field, and thus with respect to the, um, the membrane receptor. Now clearly, uh, we're not gonna, this is what you simulate, this is what you measure, um, so things are never quite as nice in the real world. Um, if you think about it here, we're measuring about 20 nanomoles of a ligand down to a 280 kilodalt protein. And what you can see here, this is a deuterium spectrum. If you look at it at 0 degrees and 90 degrees, we see an orientational dependence. Okay? And so from this orientational dependence, we should be able to extract the, ori uh, the orientation of a particular functional group with respect to the magnetic field. Now in this case, we don't have a single crystal. These things have a distribution. Uh, of orientations around the preferred direction. So we have to simulate this here. And that's what we have with this so-called mosaic spray that we see here. But what you see is we can basically come up with a unique solution for the two different orientations we, were measure, we measured spectra at. And from this information, we could basically deduce that this 
the terminal ammonium group here is oriented at 42 degrees with respect to the membrane norm, so basically the long axis of this uh, protein here. And we'll come back to the story a bit later on because we've basically been able to use this type of information to then dock these ligands into the binding site on these receptors. Yeah. Um, does a lot of this depend on deuterating certain parts? Yeah, so this... And if uh, so, is that, can I, as a theorist, just say deuterate that, that, that part? Or is it you can, but then what you might find is you have some rugby chemists. Uh, so it pays when you sit there to ask to get the deuteration done to check where you want to introduce it. So for example, here is actually a relatively uh, simple exercise. Because if you look here, we've got a methyl group here, a methyl group here, and a methyl group here. And we have an ammonium group here. So basically, if you're a biochemist, uh, even a biochemist can mix ethanolamine with, so this is basically an, uh, an alcohol here, two CH2s in an amine group, with methyl iodide, you stir it overnight, and in the morning as your product forms, it crystallizes and drops to the bottom of the tube and you can purify it. However, if you're a chemist, if you're a biochemist who wants to put deuterons or carbon 13s in this bit here, that becomes a little bit more challenging. So it pays to sit there and talk nicely to the, uh, the organic chemists, the synthetic chemists first, uh, and get them to think a little bit laterally about how they want to, how you can introduce it. But sometimes it may make your life very easy, but it might make their life very hard. And sometimes both people can come in it together and get some form of compliments. There's actually a whole series of uh, people doing synthetic chemistry uh, looking at how you can introduce isotopes. Because it's by no means trivial, because what you want to do is basically maximize the efficiency and the steps where you're introducing the labels. And so that's not necessarily how you would typically do it. Most synthetic chemists basically want to optimize their yield. Here, basically, what you do want to do is optimize the yield when you have your labels present. And so sometimes it works slightly differently. And the other thing that people find quite useful is so-called reverse engineering. So if you have a very, very complex biomolecule, to, to synthesize it from first principles may be very, very complex. So, for example, if you take there's a particular type of lipid, a ubiquinone that you find in cell membranes, we wanted to deuterate that. Now, if you synthesize it from first principles, it's a, it's a huge length of synthesis. But you can go and buy um, ubiquinone from a hole in Barrett for a relatively reasonable price. You can knock off the group and then add back the label you want, and uh, this is basically a two-day reaction. So, it pays for total organic things. Okay, so this is an example where basically we've done selective labelling. When we've done this selective labelling, we can sit there and look at the orientation of a particular function of um, Now, the other way we can sit there and start to look at these things um, is to look at the uniformly labelled samples. So, um, a lot of my group, for example, wastes, wastes a lot of time trying to introduce, for example, nitrogen 15, carbon 13 into proteins uniformly. Now this presents itself with a challenge. So we saw earlier, if we take a powder spectrum, for example, of a, a protein, which is N15 labeled, we'll have a powder distribution. Now, the nice thing is, if we can start to orient this sample in the magnetic field, all of a sudden we start to get back some resolution. Um, but, um, so yeah, so here, for example, if you look just in the X direction of this spectrum here, what you find is basically the, the nitrogen 15 spectrum you would get from an oriented sample. But even if you do that, what you find is that if, for example, you have a peptide sitting in a bilayer, many of the residues are going to be basically superimposed on one another. But what we can do is basically go one stage further. And just as in liquid state NMR, you can do correlation spectroscopy. Also, in solid state NMR of oriented samples, you can also do correlation spectroscopy. And in this case, what um, Peller and co workers have basically pioneered is basically the correlation of uh, the chemical shielding anisotropy with the uh, nit proton nitrogen uh, dipole coupling. Yeah. And so here what you have is basically a two-dimensional what we call separated local field experiment uh, on this oriented sample. So in the x direction here we have our nitrogen 15 chemical shift which orientates our, chem orients our chemical shielding anisotropy. And in the y direction here we have our proton N15 dipole coupling which orientates our, orients our A an H vector within the sample. And so we basically we get this nice plot that we see here. Now the nice thing about this experiment is the fact that if you have your chemical shielding anisotropy and your heteronuclear dipole coupling vector mapped out and you know what values these uh, two interactions have, 
what you can actually do is pretty much uniquely identify the orientation of a particular peptide bond with respect to the magnetic field. So for each amino acid in the peptide backbone, what you're seeing is basically a particular orientation of this peptide bond. So in principle, in this type of data that you see here, you have all the information which is necessary to go through and basically reconstruct the structure of the molecule. So that's quite a nice, easy, elegant experiment. And this has been used basically quite widely for about the last 30 years. Um, okay, the last one for this part of the lecture. Uh, we can also use it to look at, the, for example, things like the local electrostatic environment. So this is an example that's probably familiar to several people here. If you take, for example, the nitrogen site in uh, a retinal molecule bound to um, rhodopsin or bacterial rhodopsin. So these are the proteins which are sitting at the back of your eye and are picking up the light that's basically hitting the back of your retina. And so what people have been able to do here is they've taken the static NMR spectrum. And what you can do is basically, because uh, this nitrogen here is basically in the shift phase, depending on its protonation state, what you find is you can see huge differences um, in the chemical shielding of that and so, very simply, you can take your, um, you can take your bacterial rhodopsin membranes, uh, you can measure your static nitrogen 15 spectrum, where you've labeled this site here, and you can very quickly work out if your um, shift base is in a protonated or a non-protonated state. Okay? And I think, I should leave it there, we have a few minute break, I'm going to carry on, perhaps at 12 o'clock, yeah? <coughs> Just so I can get my thoughts back. <coughs> yep. <coughs> we just discussed uh, how we can get information out from these oriented, macroscopically aligned oriented samples. And uh, it just dawned on me, or maybe I'll come back to that again in a later lecture and I'll try and put up some examples so you can actually see what some of these samples look like. But it's actually quite challenging to make them. It's a bit like crystallography, um, it's a bit like black magic as opposed to um, science. Um, so the, the other way that we can get resolution back in our spectrum is basically a uh, technique which most of you should be familiar with in any case, we call magic angle spinning. So with magic angle spinning, what we're essentially trying to do is uh, average out these anisotropic interactions which give rise to our broad spectrum. So for those of you who've never seen one before, how many of you do magic angle spinning? Only one, yeah, this is what I thought. Actually, yeah, there's not many people here doing solid state NMR. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this is what I'm magic angle spinning. You do? No, no, no. no. Yeah. Okay, so this is what a magic angle spinning approach looks like. Um, so, yeah, so the idea is, is what we're trying to do is basically reintroduce the mechanical, reintroduce uh, the averaging of these anisotropic interactions that you see in solution by a uh, mechanical process. So, here what you do is you see the top of the probe head. Um, and basically what we do is we take one of these rotors here, we sit there, we pack it full of our sample, we get some, you know, varying degrees of difficulty depending on the size. Then what we do is we drop this into the little hole here, and very simply we have this small uh, turbine at one end, blow air against, so that pushes it round, and at the same time we have these, you can see them actually here to blow apart, uh, these so-called air bearings, this is basically lifting our sample up. So if we're lucky, then what we can do is we can basically we can rotate that sample within the, mag in the magnetic field. And uh, currently you can do this up to about 110 kilohertz. Or in Southampton up to about 45 kilohertz. So the idea is though, when you do this, what you're going to do is basically average out these anisotropic interactions so we get our sort of liquid state style at the So what Averaging of anisotropic interactions. So this is just an example. Uh, it appears in all the Tux textbooks. They've all been misquoted. Uh, so basically, this is some spectra I recorded many, many years ago. So this is the lysine that you record. This carbon 13 N15 labeled. If you measure it static, you see the following profile on the screen here. If you start to spin it at 5 kilohertz, what you find is that this powder distribution here breaks down into two relatively intense lines. And then we have these. Uh, it's what we call side bands here, which is separated by the uh, spinning frequency. And if we spin a bit faster still, what we find is that the number of side bands goes down and the intensity of our central line goes up. Uh, 
So I think the rough rule is, is basically the first moment always stays the same. And so the net result is, if you start to spin a sample at a speed which is equal to or slightly greater than the size of your anisotropic interaction, at least the things like chemical shielding and anisotropy, what you should find is you basically average out these anisotropic interactions. And what we'd like to do is perhaps try and understand why that is. And so there can be lots of maths to work out why it works, but it's actually a very nice fridge you can use to try and understand it. So what I just told you a moment ago is when you're looking for the when you're looking for the chemical shift, what you're looking for is a component which is aligned along the uh, the magnetic field at any point in time. Okay. So the question is, is why is this angle of 54.7 degrees so special? Well, if you think about it, the angle of 54.7 degrees is basically the diagonal across the cube. Okay. So now, if you rotate uh, around that axis, what does that mean? Well, that means what you're going to do is basically you're going to swap x, x, y, y, and z, z for one another. So if we rotate it once, for example, we'll put z, z where x, x is, and y, y where z, z is, and so on. So basically what we're going to do is basically slowly project each of these different axes onto the magnetic field. Okay? Now if we do it fast enough, what we'll see is basically the average of all of these things. Okay? So if you spin the sample fast enough, what you'll end up with is basically a third of sigma x, x sigma y, y, plus sigma z, z which is your isotropic chemical shift. That's maths that by chemists and medics can understand. Yeah? Okay? Uh, so, nice, nice simple way of actually working out what's going on when you do these type of experiments. Um, yeah, but that's very, very nice in one way, it enables us to actually understand phenomenologically what goes on. Uh, if we actually want to try and understand what's actually happening in our experiment and then try and design experiments which will perhaps undo the action of magic angle spinning, we perhaps need to be a little bit more rigorous about this. So in this case, what we find now is that in contrast to all the Hamiltonians that we saw before, where a Hamiltonian is time independent, now all of a sudden what we find is that the position of our molecule with respect to time is changing constantly. Okay? And so now we need our the other angles, alpha, beta, and gamma, that relate the principal axis system to the laboratory frame, but then we also have time in here. So somehow we need to find ways of dealing with time. And so what people typically do is they deconvolute this into what we call an isotropic and an anisotropic column. So if you look at the isotropic column, this is your isotropic chemical shift. This is essentially the trace of your tensor. Okay? And then we have our chemical shielding and isotropy, which has these three uh, Euler angles and the time dependency. And so what people have been able to show is basically you can look at this chemical shielding anisotropy here and you can express it in the following terms. So you can actually work out the position of your resonance line in a function. Uh, sorry, you can work out the, the resonance frequency uh, using the following types of expression we have here. Um, and you can actually um, use uh, these types of terms here. Um, yeah, okay, we'll leave that for now. So if you want to analyze these, uh, um, okay, yeah. So anyway, so we have this time dependency of the chemical shielding anisotropy. So we can basically, at any point in time, now we can calculate what our resonance frequency should be. And so in principle, we should be in a position to basically regenerate what our FID should look like. Now. As I said, all these interactions become time dependent, so it means that we can't calculate a unique resonance frequency. So we need to come up with tricks which enable us to treat these time dependencies. Um, this is not necessarily so trivial. Um, there's several mathematical descriptions which enable us to do these. So we have so-called average Hamiltonian theorem. So this is basically trying to calculate what we would see on average over a rotor cycle. We have a Floquet theorem. So this basically, uh, the mathematicians here, enables us to blow up the size of our space. We can basically expand the Hamiltonian as a series of Fourier sums, um, and we'll basically remove the time dependence. And then we've got the, the nice computational way we can basically do piecewise integration. We can do it on a computer, and we can do it relatively fast. So in terms of understanding, I think these two techniques here enable you to understand what's going on theoretically in your sample. So if you're trying to understand the full sequence, these give you some form of intellectual oversight. Whereas the piecewise integration, it's great if you want to numerically crunch 
what the spectra should look like. So if you look at things like spinach, if you look at things like gamma, these types of techniques are basically using the sort of piecewise integration approach. Um, and when they do that, it's a very powerful tool if you basically want to um, be able to put in input sort of uh, parameters and try and relate them to experiment. So, assuming we can do this, what happens? So, if we first of all look at the slow speed spinning case, what we find is that if we look at RFID, what we have are these basically so called rotational echoes forming on it. Okay? So we have these beads which are appearing on RFID. And each bead is synchronized with one third of the rotor. Okay? So for all the mathematicians amongst us, we could do a Fourier transform of these beads. And if we get a Fourier transform of these beads, what we should end up with is a family a sideband family. So if you go back to the experimental data I showed you earlier, if you do the Fourier transform of this type of FID, you'll have this type of distribution here. Okay? And so, in principle, each of these sidebands encodes information about the anisotropy and the asymmetry parameter. Okay? So, the advantage we have before, I said, we could basically use these uh, anisotropic interactions to study what's going on at the molecular level. The downside was we were doing it in powder samples. And in powder samples, all our intensity is distributed over the entire powder distribution. Now what we've done is basically we've focused this intensity into a series of, um, into this sideband family. So in contrast to looking at powder samples, these sideband families are actually a lot more intense. So basically in terms of studying biological samples where our signal to noise is, in the no is, is usually pretty horrible, this actually offers us quite a lot of advantages. So if we, require, if we acquire these low speed spinning spectra, what we can do is basically extra extract this, um, the asymmetry parameter and the anisotropy. Question is, how do we do this? Well, the way it was first proposed was an analysis by Hertzfeld and Berger. And they came up with some, um, basically, uh, nice maths which enables you to calculate the intensity of a particular sideband <coughs> from a particular given uh, anisotropic interaction. Uh, and I'm not going to go through all that. Basically, they come up with a series of tables which enables you to read out what delta and uh, the asymmetry parameter should be. And I think they're in the appendices of this, these overheads which I can put up um, on Blackboard. In reality, how do we sit there and analyze these sidebar families? Well, we have these tables from the Hertzfeld and Berger paper. But probably uh, for most people here, you know, the easiest way to do it, if you take something like Matt NMR, what you can do is basically um, there are very standard fitting procedures now, things like chemical shielding and isotropy and quadrupolar interactions, which you never need to get out, these, um, get, get out the anisotropy and asymmetry parameter relatively easily. Um, similarly, there's also sort of sideband analysis. But with the speed that computers work now, you can also basically just do a piecewise integration, simulate your spectrum and fit it. It's relatively trivial. Okay? So these ways you can basically just use a number crunching approach, simulate the, um, side, simulate the spectrum, fit it, see if you can do better next time, okay? But if we do this, now all of a sudden what we have is a tool which enables us to sit there and basically characterize these interactions with a little bit more sensitivity than we would have if we just looked at the power spectrum. Now, that's fine, but what happens if we don't set our magic angle for rotating? So, if we rotate our sample um, slightly off the magic angle, all sorts of strange things happen. So for the people who are doing it without knowing, uh, what happens is they get horrible line shapes, uh, they get very bad resolution, and they go home very unhappy. Um, what you see though is basically the width of the line is basically scaled um, by how far it is away from the magic angle. So if you see we're at the magic angle, here we get a sharp line. If you rotate about zero degrees, we essentially recreate the power spectrum because nothing's actually happening. And if we rotate about 90 degrees, you can plug 90 degrees into this equation here. I know my Greek symbols have been messed up again. And basically what you see is it's scaled by minus one half. Now, you're probably thinking, okay, great. Why do we care about this? Well, actually, you care about it because <coughs> if you know what you're doing, you can actually use these types of uh, techniques. So if you think about it, if we're at the magic angle, what we find is that basically we've removed all these anisotropic interactions. But if we go slightly off the magic angle, what we can do is we can fine tune the size of these uh, anisotropic interactions. So we can make it perhaps so that our chemical shielding uh, tensor is only spread across one kilohertz. 
So what a lot of people have done who have been studying things like uh, silk fibers and things like this, they've made use of a technique called off-magic angle spinning. And essentially what they've done is they've fine-tuned the angle that they rotate the sample about, characterize these tensors, and then do correlation spectra to look at the orientation of different uh, chemical shielding isotropies. And in doing so, they can then start to work out what the secondary structure is in their protein sample. So you can actually use a missetting of the magic angle to your advantage if you know that you're doing it. Okay? And if anyone's interested in this, then they should let me know. And I can find some papers for you. Um, but it also points out, if you're doing high resolution magic angle spinning NMR, you do need to make sure that you set your magic angle carefully. Because otherwise, if you think about, for example, your carbon ion tensor, uh, chemical shielding isotropy, where you have an isotropy of perhaps 100 ppm or so, um, it does mean that if you're slightly off the angle, then you perhaps have a line which is already one or two ppm wide, which is not necessarily what you want if you want to resolve all your sites in your hundred percent of protein. So the question is, when does that magic angle spinning not work? Uh, well, magic angle spinning doesn't work quite so well if we have so-called homogeneous interactions. So, uh, what do I mean by homogeneous interactions? Uh, Homogeneous examples of homogeneous interactions would be things like, for example, if we have um, homonuclear, uh, extensive homonuclear dipole coupling in the system. So if you have lots of protons all talking to other protons in the system, what we have is basically a homogeneous uh, interaction. So things no longer commute. And so when we have these uh, strong homonuclear uh, dipole interactions, what we tend to find is that our magic angle spinning doesn't work as effectively. So obviously it doesn't work, and this doesn't work as effectively. So what we find is that instead of having to spin at spinning speeds which are comparable to the size of the anisotropic interaction, we now have to spin at speeds which vastly exceed them. So if you sit there and think about it in terms of trying to, um, for example, the proton magic angle spinning NMR, our proton magic angle spinning NMR, uh, pro sorry, our proton, proton dipole coupling are typically in the order of 20 kilohertz. So naively one would think that you could basically spin at 25 kilohertz and you see a nice well-resolved proton spectrum. But because these are so-called homogeneous interactions, it means that it's only when we start to spin up at 60 or 80 kilohertz that we start to see a really effective narrowing of these lines. Okay? So this is the condition which causes the most problems. Because this is what prevents us doing proton solid state and not. Uh, it's also an issue if you have heterogeneous line work. So what do I mean by heterogeneous line working? If I take a protein, uh, which all has single conformation, I would expect every chemical shift to remain the same. Okay? Now, if somebody comes along and gives you protein which hasn't been prepared very carefully, you perhaps have lots and lots of different conformations in there. And if you have lots and lots of different conformations, each chemical shift is going to be different. And so what you tend to find is that if you take, for example, uh, the C-alpha in your um, peptide backbone, what you find is it's very sensitive to two torsion angles. And if these two torsion angles vary, what you might find is that you have basically a family of different resonances, depending on the distribution of um, conformers that you have within the sample. And that's very good, but if, for example, one of your conformers has a line width of, I don't know, perhaps 0.01 ppm, but you have thousands of conformers, what it means is all of a sudden, your resolution is perhaps 1 or 2 ppm. And that prevents you from resolving all the sites in your protein. And it doesn't matter how fast you spin or how high a field you go to, these things are basically going to scale. And as they scale, so basically, even if you sit there and go to 1.2 gigahertz and spin at 80 kilohertz, if you've got, not got a nice sample, you're always going to have overlapping resonances. And so you'll never get a uh, well-resolved spectrum. So I would say a lot, of the, a lot of the advances which have been made in the last perhaps 10, 20 years in terms of um, applying solid state NMR to biological molecules has actually come from the realization that you need to make sure the sample is happy. So you can't sit there and irradiate your sample such that the temperature goes about 50 or 60 degrees high. Because then you convert your nice homogeneous protein structure into basically scrambled egg. Okay, so you do have to be careful about these things. So heterogeneous line broadening is something we have to be careful about. We also have things where we have nuclei uh, with large quadrupolar interactions. So the quadrupolar interactions aren't completely averaged by magic angle spinning. 
That's why we have these esoteric techniques such as DOOR and MQMES where we can start to selectively remove these uh, higher order interactions. And then we have samples which are not solid. So if we have motion occurring in our sample which is occurring on the same time scale as our magic angle spinning, it interferes with our magic angle spinning. And so what tends to happen is our lines no longer get narrowed, they tend to be, become broadened. And that's, very, that's fine if you know that's what you're expecting, because then you can use the line change to provide you informa with information about the dynamics. But if all you're trying to do is resolve all the sites in the sample, that's perhaps not what you're trying to That's something that you have to think about. Okay. <coughs> right, so... Um, Applications of magic angle spinning. There are many, so we'll speak to the simple ones in a moment. We'll come back to the later on. So, primarily, what we've done is basically we've improved our resolution and we've improved our sensitivity. So, what we've done is basically taken all the spectral intensity which is currently previously distributed over the entire width of this isotropic interaction, we've focused it into a single sharp line. So, that means our intensity is a lot better than it was previously. It also means that because it's, instead of having these distributions of resonances that we had before, now we have basically single resonances for particular sites within the molecule that we're looking at. In doing so, basically what we've done is we've improved the resolution. Okay? So, I gave you an example of this before. Basically, if we do low speed uh, spinning, we can characterize the anisotropy. So, we, if we do just a couple of slow speed spinning spectra, what we can do is we can identify which are the isotropic chemical shifts. And we'll come back to this later, but we can use the isotropic chemical shift to provide us with information about the, the local electrostatic environment. And so we can also sit there, and as I showed you a moment ago, uh, in a static case, we can also look at the different components of the chemical shielding tensor to provide us with information um, about changes in basically, for example, ionization states of nitrogen and this type of thing, uh, hydrogen bonding status in protein backbones. And so basically you can um, look at these plots, basically try and fit them to your experimental data, and it gives you some idea how these principal, like, how the principal components of your shielding tensor are changing between different environments, and that can give you an, an understanding about the chemistry which is going on at the same time. Okay. Now, the other thing is we can actually use it to again enhance our signal to study uh, mobility um, in liquid bilayers. So before, well actually we can just use it generically to study the mobility in the system. So, as we saw before, we can use these uh, anisotropic interactions to look at a dynamic averaging, to sit there and look at the, the motions occurring in the system. Now, before I showed you a relatively um, noisy spectrum of um, a particular pre uh, peptide out of the acetylcholine receptor. Well now what we have, this is a so-called amyloid precursor protein. So this is the protein which is getting chewed up in your brain, which leads to amyloid disease, ultimately. And what's interesting in this case is to try and understand how accessible particular uh, cleavage sites are uh, to the action of particular proteases. And so one hypothesis is that the lipids in your brain, so the lipids in your cell membrane, change uh, in response to... Um, um, as the degree of disease progresses. And so what we're interested in is how it affects the dynamics of particular cleavage sites. So what we've done here is we've basically selectively labeled one of these peptides um, with, um, in this case, uh, again a deuteron on an aldehyde side. And what we've done is basically looked at how average the tensor is. But in this case, we had a lot less material. And so what we wanted to do is find ways of enhancing the signal to noise. And so what we can do is very simply just do slow magic angle spinning. In the case of deuterium, our slow magic angle spinning spectrum basically gives us a sideband manifold, which looks pretty much like the static spectrum. But you can actually then fit the intensities and extract out what the quadrifolar interaction should be. And what we can do here is if we take, for example, a DMPC spectrum, so this is a relatively thin liquid by then, we look in the gel phase, we see that it's relatively restricted. If we move into a more liquid crystalline phase, we see that it's a lot more mobile. If you, for example, look at uh, these unsaturated lipids here, we see very little difference between the two. And so what we've been able to do is basically look at how the dynamics of the, um, this particular cleavage site changes as we alter the thickness of the binder. And we can use this to inform us as to the accessibility of these cleavage sites to the types of proteases. So again, we've not done anything very clever in terms of NMR. We've just done slow magic angle spinning and applied for a very long time. Okay? And then we can start to read this out from the sideband panel. 
And just as a last aside, just to sort of prove that we um, don't just do solid state and then master solid structures of proteins. Um, I started a while ago when we uh, kicked off telling me that what we're interested in biology is really understanding this hierarchy. So we want to know what's going on at the molecular level and we want to feed it back up to what's going on at the organism level. Now it's quite challenging uh, to do whole animal uh, NMR with solid state NMR because if you're going to do magic animal spinning, the rotors are usually quite restrictive. If you choose your organism carefully, you can actually do whole body NMR. And so, uh, in this case, the organism we used was a worm called C. elegans. And um, the nice thing about this worm is it's relatively small. A couple of millimeters long, fractions of millimeters wide. So you can put about 400 of them into an NMR tube. And when you do that, and you spin at about 4,000 hertz, what do you find is you get actually a relatively well-resolved proton magic angle spinning spectrum. And so, and the reason we need to do the magic angle spinning, in this case, is because we've discussed all these different uh, anisotropic interactions. But one of the ones that we did read about was susceptibility. So susceptibility is also a second rank tensor. So it's also averaged by um, magic angle spinning. So if you have a worm which has many different compartments, always slightly different susceptibilities, what you find is when you do magic angle spinning, you get some resolution back in the spectrum. Uh, the other nice thing with these worms is the fact that basically they contain a lot of fat inside them and they're relatively dynamic. So e even though we're looking at a proton spectrum, we actually get good resolution. Now this isn't as esoteric as, as you may think. Um, this susceptibility problem has been occur uh, occurred several times before. So for example, if people are trying to look at oil that's coming out of oil wells, um, people have actually used magic angle spinning in a model talk to again remove this susceptibility um, problem and get high resolution spectra back. And so that way you can sort of use it to quantitate the type of oil that you have in your sample, or in this case, the type of fats that you have in your worm. So just to prove to you that this is sort of moderately useful, here what we've done is got basically just a proton spectrum of um, RC elegans after a, a nice healthy diet of uh, bacteria. And what you can see is that you can see it's rich in things like fatty acids. You can see that there's a lot of things here from the sugars that are present inside this little worm. And then we can start to see some stuff here from proteins, so we've got ABs, amides, and some aromatics. So that's sort of nice. We can basically start to identify different metabolites within the sample. Now, what happens first in an organism? Well, normally what happens if you, for example, are going to stand on the treadmill for half an hour, what tends to happen first of all is we tend to burn carbohydrate. And so you tend to, you tend to burn glycogen in your liver, glycogen in your muscle. And so what we'd expect to see if we start to starve this worm is the fact that their sugar levels will go down rapidly. And that's exactly what you see. So these are the peaks here that we assigned to um, sugar resonances within the spectrum. And what we see over the time span of five hours, if we don't give them any food, well, the sugar disappears. That's nice, so we can start to understand the metabolism of what's going on. So what happens if we starve ourselves a bit longer? So it's half past 12 now, uh, I'm ready for lunch. Um, so hopefully my fatty acid metabolism is kicking in. And so what you find now is that these peaks here on the right hand side these are attributable to the fatty acids in that sample. And now what we see is basically the fatty acid signals start to go down. So again, what I hope to have demonstrated is that basically just using some very, very simple magic angle spinning NMR experiments um, and a little bit of clever biology, we can just use that NMR as an analytical tool to start to look at the level of metabolites that we have in, in this case, a whole organism. But this would equally be as relevant if you start to look, for example, things like tissue biopsies so people do very similar experiments on, for example, cancer tissues to try and identify you know, metabolites that are present, try to elevate it or suppress it. So it works very, very nicely. Um, so, like I said, it's very, it's very simple. We've got nice, simple markers for different metabolites. We can basically use it quantitatively to look at changes in metabolite levels. And, you know, in this case, it's nice, this C. elegans worm is one of the best studied organisms on the face of this planet. We actually know exactly how many neurons it has, how, how many cells it has. And so people have come up with all sorts of mutations so we can basically manipulate all these pathways. So we can really start to understand, dissect our mutations at a protein level and start to affect what's going on at the metabolite level. So hopefully what I've done is giving you a view about how we can go use very simple magic angle spinning NMR or very, very simple solid state NMR We've gone from basically looking at things on the molecular level to basically the whole organism.
And I'm going to back up there because I overran the first half. And then next week, what we'll do is we'll go back and we'll look at some of the tools that we used with Magic on the spinning NMR to enhance our signal and try and get some structural data. Yep. Okay.